Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us on the second night of our breeding webinars. For anybody who wasn't with us on last Wednesday night, my name is Martina Harrington, and I'm the manager of the Future Beef Demonstration Farm Programme, which is Chagas's suckler demonstration farm programme, with 22 suckler beef farms spread right throughout the country, from Monaghan down to Port Arlington in, in Leash, um, Offaly, to Ardratton in County Galway, down to Skibbereen. So we farmers spread right throughout the country the country. The aim of our program is to demonstrate how you can make your farm more profitable through efficiency while also reducing the impact on the environment. Our program is sponsored by 10 meat processors and I would like to thank them sincerely for their continued support and we'll have their names and their logos on the beginning of Ashley's presentation. As we said on Wednesday night, the calving and the breeding seasons are critical to ensure profitability for Irish suckler farmers. So it's getting that live calf onto the ground, which we're nearly through the, the calving season now, and then getting its mother back in calf. And as Gabriel showed on night one, a small difference like going from the national average of 0.87 calves per cow per year up to a calf per cow per year on a 35 cow herd like Shane Keevney's would mean a selling of an extra five weanlands and that can be worth four and a half thousand euros. So well worth uh, trying to improve your, your breeding performance on your farm. Tonight we'll have two farmers, Angus Fahey from Ardratton in County Galway and we have John Dunn from Port Arlington on the Leash Offaly border and they're going to take us through what they're doing to get their cows back in calf and what technologies they're using and they'll share their experiences with yourselves. We also have David Kenny from Chagas on with us. David has completed extensive studies in reproductive research focused on suckler cows, cows including synchronisation programmes. The session will be moderated by Ashling Malai, one of our programme advisors. And as we go down at the bottom of the seat screen, you'll see a Q&A box at the bottom. So any questions that you have, put your questions in there and we'll endeavour to ask them as we move through the evening. So Ashling, I'll let you share your screen there now. Perfect. Thanks, Martina. Okay, so um, thanks very much, Martina. Um, as Martina said, my name is Ashling Malloy. I'm an advisor on the Future Beef Programme and I'm covering the southwest of the country. And I'm working alongside Gabriel Trayers, who's covering up in the northwest of the country. And that's the list of our sponsors down the bottom. And we're also involved um, with the under, under the umbrella of the Signpost Programme as well. So we're going to focus tonight on that 365 day calving interval and trying to keep the cow to that. So if we look here at day one, so we'll take, for example, the cow is calving on the 1st of February 2024 this year. It's going to take on average 55 days for her to come cycling again after calving for a beef cow. And that's also known as the postpartum interval. So if she comes cycling after her 55 days, that's going to give us two opportunities to put her back in calf. And that's on her after her first heat. And then um, three weeks later on her second cycle, then after that. So. Ideally, she should be back in calf by the 1st of May 2024. That's allowing for 288 days here of a gestation. Um, now, obviously, we can um, influence that by bull selection and that as well. But the idea is that she's calving back down again for the 1st of February 2025. All going well. So if we have a look at this, the first thing is this postpartum interval. And how do we get this cow back cycling in the first place? And this is where we have to try and reduce the 55 days to give her the best possible chance. And by doing this, we're looking at correcting the body condition score, minimizing the calving difficulty, having good management at and after calving. And that's down to hygiene and animal health as well. And getting that cow to grass as soon as possible after calving to meet them high nutritional demands that she's going to have. So a lot of this was covered on the first night of the webinar. So what we're going to focus on tonight is this 21 day period or if we can make that longer and, and getting the cow back in calf and what management decisions you can make on your farm to do this. So we're going to look at the stock bull management and that's down to bull fertility, doing a bull NCT, how many cows should be running with um, whether it's a younger or an older bull. And then if you're buying a new bull, trying to acclimatize him to the farm as well um, and get him used to, to, to the place before the breeding season starts. Um, the second thing, if anybody's AI in, is that the bulls are picked, the straws are ordered, and that you make contact with your technician as well. Thirdly, is the heat detection needs, observation, and most importantly, and I think that'll come across from Angus and from John tonight, is having records there as well to, to be able to monitor throughout the breeding season. 
And finally, if you need a bit of help, there's plenty of options there in terms of synchronization. Um, sex semen it has become way more available in the last couple of years for the beef herd as well. And there's also technology there as well, that, that technology aids that can help as well. And we'll discuss some of these as we're going through it. So first of all, we're going to have a quick look at an introduction video for Angus Afahi. And we'll move into a few questions then at that stage. Uh, Inga Say here in Ardrahan in County Galway. Uh, my farming here uh, with Sucker Cows here in this farm, and I have another farm in County Clare, uh, which is 35 minutes away, in also, uh, which we finish all our dry stock. Here I'm uh, teaching uh, uh, down at the is around 20 minutes away. I'm lucky enough, um, my wife's teacher as well, and um, we have two kids, uh, one and a uh, four year old. Um, which will hopefully be involved in farming soon. Uh, my parents uh, are here at home as well, and they're retired. Um, they obviously, you know, they, they're good as well. They keep an eye on things. Kevin here in the first week in February. Obviously, we started breeding on the 26th, really, or 23rd of April. Last year, 26th this year, we're going for. Uh, we we do that. Um, I tried to have AI for six weeks, and then the bull for the last three weeks. Uh, we try to keep it as compact as we possibly can. I'm working off, off farm, um, obviously teaching. So I like it's hard enough to dedicate your time to other things. So I just try to just dedicate my my time just to care from the cows, um, getting them out in grass, getting back into cycling again. So having them compact uh, allows me to do that. I started using uh, AI about four years ago. I started kind of small, okay. Um, I was trying to improve my breeding from from that, but um, I had a few little tweaks I had to make on it. Um, I, why I really uh, did it was um, I wanted to improve uh, the, my replacements, uh, I wanted to improve my herd, and um, I was buying stock and replacement heifers and that, and it just wasn't working out for me. Okay, so thanks for coming on, Ingeza. Thanks very much, Ashley. You're very good. Um, so we mentioned earlier in the night that you have two chances to get your cows back in calf. And you've said yourself in the video, there's a few things you're doing as well. So what are you doing to maximise the chances of this happening on your farm? Um, well, first of all, um, it starts really the year before. I'd pick an easy calf from uh, bull. Um, generally, like usually if I can get a, a calf on the, the ground easy enough and then getting the cow out onto grass, get the body condition score on them. Um, a lot of the time, um, after that, once I get mountain grass, it's really heat detection. Then, um, usually I just keep an eye on what's going on with the cows, and we see if you know, if there's anything dirty or anything like that, anything going on that I'm unsure of. And then, I um scan the cows about three to four weeks beforehand, and uh, depending on you know, when I have time and stuff like that, I'm a teacher. And uh, by that, we have the holidays next week, so obviously I'll be doing it. Uh, from now, um. We will see what's going on with all the, the cows, the seeds are cycling, see what's going on. Then I'd uh, put on my, my moo heat uh, sensor on straight away after. And then um we that does the recording of the of the the cows. Um I'd see what cycle on that. Now I wouldn't have to keep as much uh, attention on that. I'd just see what's cycling, what's not. And then I'd see after the three weeks then just before uh, breeding, I see if there's no things not still cycling, I would obviously call out the vet and see what's going on and get it scanned and see what what what's, what has to be done um really yeah and then it um then just continues um we just look at the we'd look at the the monitor we look on our phone see what's cycling what's not cycling from then for the next three weeks and hopefully we get them all in the the first six weeks then brilliant on that. Um, you mentioned the moo heat there is one of the heat detection aids that you're using on the farm. Could you explain to us what exactly that is, Ingeza, please? Oh, well, it's a simple uh, device. Um, first of all, you have a tag on the you have a tag on the cow, and then you have a, a collar around the fasciculumized bull. Um, the, the you you get a text a text message that comes in once the the fasciculumized bull is mounted or takes heat in the the cow, and it says low. Uh, medium and high. Generally, if it's low, it might be something anything going on at all. Medium and high says there's something actually happening, and then 
you you just see from the text message. So it's really just simple. It's just a, a little tag on the the code that you 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 record on your phone with the tag number of the code, or you can actually call the name of the code, whatever you want. Usually, you just keep the 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 name of the the the, the tag on it or the number of the tag and just uh, record on your phone. And then you have the move the move um move or move sensor around the neck of the vasectomize, and that's all it is. Brilliant. And yeah. in terms of cost in that, what are you looking at firstly? And secondly, do you need a Wi-Fi connection there for the collar and the tags to work? No, you don't need any, uh, no uh, Wi-Fi whatsoever. Um, yeah. It goes on GPS. Um, the cost, the initial cost for me uh, to buy the Moo uh, sensor, the Moo heat sensor was a thousand euros at the time. Now, I think it varies, you know, you can buy them at different times. They always have a deal there and you get two years, um, two years, uh, kind of credit in it or whatever two years on it and then it's 350 a year after that and uh, to, to, to run it so the, after that there's no cost really and uh, the tags you get you get i think it's 50 tags at the at the start and they're around 250 after that to, to buy it. but you don't need any tags really after that they don't fall off or anything like that they're really small and um, the costs are very minimal once you pay the 350 a year and once you have the actual device bought it, that's all you have like Brilliant, brilliant. And in terms of the, the vasectomized bull, could you talk us through how you source them and um, how you manage him then on your farm? Well, I source my, I have a local dairy farm that I buy them off. Um, I, um, I just buy a, a normal uh, Frisian uh, bull calf. Generally, I try to get them three or four weeks old, kind of very rare. I'd wear them then at home. Uh, on milk replacer and then I keep them obviously on milk replacer and introduce them onto the meal and then uh, after 10 weeks then we'll just let him off with the other the other uh, calves he generally generally he uh, he uh, creep creates in front of the rest of the cows kind of um, we feed a bit of meal to him and then around September time then we uh, we vasectomize him then before you know he go in and you know it'd be a nice and clean area and he'd be a probably around 250, 300 kilos at that stage. And then once he let off the calves again, the other calves, and then he got back into the shed and then he's let out, kind of treated with the heifers then. He's just let off the heifers and see what's going on then. And there's nothing really major after that then. Brilliant. And you don't keep them any longer than... No, than then, then, okay. um, then, uh, then, like say, the following breeding season, uh, we'd... Um, once he's finished his job, usually there's a few cows there that, you know, whatever they mightn't have gone, gone in calf, they'd be whatever I'd be getting rid of, I'd be fatting them. I usually I'd feed two or three cows together along with him maybe, and he usually always gone the following September, so he's just around a year really on the farm, and usually always finds I always have got the fat score on him. He's always gone, and there's never really a problem really with that because, you know, he's always with a, a cow as well, like you know, so there's never a problem like. Very good. An extra yeah. pair of hands on the farm, nearly. Yeah, yeah, my job, yeah. Brilliant. Um, we're joined this evening by Professor David Kenny from Chagas and Grange. And David, you have a huge amount of research done on fertility in the beef herd from every different aspect, I suppose. Mm. But from a stock management point of view, what do you think is the most important thing that a farmer can do to improve conception rates on their farm this spring? Yeah, sure. I suppose, Ashling, um, and good, e good evening to everybody listening. Um, you know, obviously fertility, like so many things, is multifactorial. So it's really, you know, it's like the chicken and egg. But if we start really, we'll say when the cow calves down, you know, all the work that we've done, and, and particularly would we'll say my colleague, uh, Professor Michael Diskin over the years, had looked at, I suppose, the effect of body condition score in particular. You know, so again, cows calf in, in moderate to good condition, not over fast and certainly not, you know, uh, too thin. That's probably the, the basis really, we'll say, from which I suppose the fertility so a year essentially would say our fertility events um emanate. So essentially we'll say that what that does, Ashling, is that that helps to reduce the interval between when the cow calves and when she resumes normal cyclicity again. In other words, has normal you know uh, heat cycles afterwards. You know, and so uh, uh, what uh, ultimately then you have more cows you know that are cycling at the start of the breeding season, and ultimately giving them a, a much better chance then of conceiving. We'll say within you know a ten week, twelve week, whatever the length of time the breeding season might be, and certainly uh, you more cows um, conceiving within the first three three weeks. We'll say in particular the breeding season. So I suppose carefully your cows down in moderate to good condition it would be the, start, the starting point. After that, then obviously would we'll say if you're using a stock bull, it's really important, you know, to assess the fertility of that bull well prior to the to the breeding season. And again, you know, 
just because a bull was fertile last year doesn't mean that he's going to be fertile again the, the following year. You know, so it's very important to get those bulls assessed in, well in plenty of time before the start of the breeding season. And ideally, get a full veterinary health check conducted because it's not just, I suppose, the semen quality, for example. It's also the locomotion, would say, or the limb quality of the bull, the general health of the bull. Because, you're, you know, in many cases, you're asking the bull, would say, to, to do a substantial amount of work, particularly in the first six weeks of the, bre the breeding season. And they can often lose up to 10% of their body weight during that, during that period. If you're using AI, then heat detection, as Agus has, has very clearly pointed out, they're absolutely critical. You know, you need to put in the time, effort, you know, into detecting heats on a daily basis. Because, again, if you can put in the time or effort into heat detection and or if you don't have the technologies like what Angus, some of the, those that Angus have, has, has um, outlined, well, then you can't expect to get good results from AI. So heat detection is absolutely critical. Outside of that, then, in terms of the cows themselves, the you know maintaining a i suppose a consistent uh um grass ahead of the cows would say or diet ahead of the cows avoid fluctuations like we've shown before in studies there where cows are used to would say you know so, uh, or, um, substantial amount of grass you know it's, um that if they're for whatever reason due to you know inclement weather poor growth conditions you know in the middle of the breeding season are exposed to you know uh, a shortage of grass well, then you can see conception rates um, declining by up to 50%. So having that steady supply of grass ahead of cows at all times is absolutely critically important. And outside of that, then we know that in certain cases, you know, mineral deficiencies and certain dis reproductive diseases, we'll say, can be can contribute in certain farms. But again, in our studies where we've looked at thousands of cows, essentially over cow herds across the entire island of our, uh, Ireland, in general, we'll say the contribution of either mineral status or reproductive diseases is quite small. So I think it's it's more of the of the aforementioned factors, uh, really, we'll say, and as I say, multi multidisciplinary. Very good. And of course, that grass is a big thing this year as well, because yeah. we know the challenges that are, are facing farmers with weather and that too. Um, but that leads nicely on to John Dunn. So I'm going to share his introduction video here now and I'll ask John to turn on his camera. Hello, uh, my name is John Dunn and I'm farming here just beside Port Harrington. Um, we have a, a suckler farm and um, we calve about 90 cows and then we buy in some dairy bred calves as well also and, and we bring all those calves to um, two-year-old beef. Um, we also grow some grain on the farm which we use on the farm for feeding cattle and uh, we also use the straw on the farm. So we've had some breeding issues in the past and uh, our suckler numbers had fallen. We are now trying to rebuild the herd and um, we have bought in some breeding heifers in the past, but we're trying to um, breed our own uh, from here on. Um, we're using AI and um, we're, we're synchronizing both cows and heifers to try and get the, the best replacement calves possible. And then we also use a, a Charlotte stock bull and an Angus stock bull uh, for heifers. Welcome John, thanks very much for joining us this evening. Good evening Ashling, and good evening to your listeners. Thank you, very good. Um, so you mentioned in your video there that you've had some breeding issues in the past. Would you like to talk us through what happened? Uh, yes Ashling, we, um, uh, I suppose going back to um, 2018 uh, was the start of our problems. Um, First of all, uh, I've been in sucklers for uh, 35 years and always had good conception rates, you know, 90, 95%, um, uh, all very automatic with uh, stock bulls and uh, always very happy. In um, 2018, um, it was a real hot year, if you remember, and um, uh, our, our replacements, our, our um, uh, pregnancy rates um, uh, really decreased and... Um, but we put it down to the weather, you know, and really did nothing about it. So the next year, um, 2019, um, we had a repeat of the same problem. And, uh, and like, we don't want to carry any passengers on the farm. So they, these cows, the Burton and Calf, were being fattened and culled, and we were losing good genetics um, also. So um, um, in order to um, solve the problem, we started to buy in replacement heifers. And um, then in, in 2020, 20 
we uh, purchased an Angus bull uh, uh, at a pedigree bull sale, uh, fertility tested, all perfect. And he was a very active bull and I was delighted, you know, um, um, left him there for the breeding season for 12 weeks. And um, but when we scanned those heifers the following autumn, when we brought them home, um, uh, none of them were in calf. So really at this stage, the wheels were coming off the wagon uh, pretty rapidly. And um, we had to... Um, uh, take serious steps to uh, uh, rectify the problem. Um, we also have a, a, a dairy uh, calf to beef enterprise on the farm. So we were able to immediately uh, uh, increase the dairy bred calves on the farm, which alleviates the problem in the short term. But to get our suckler herd back on track, um, the light bulb moment, I suppose, was synchronization. So we started two years ago. Um, um, we bought in a batch of replacement heifers not top quality heifers, but just good commercial heifers. And uh, we uh, synchronized those heifers and uh, AI them. And uh, we found that to be very successful. And um, we had a good bunch of heifers there calving fairly early on in the breeding season. And those calves are now a year old on the farm and we're quite happy with them. So um, moving on then to the following year, last breeding season, we synchronized uh, uh, a similar batch of heifers and we also uh, synchronized some of the cows so um, the the conception rates weren't as good uh, last spring but yet you know the whole system really is getting us back on track and uh, this year now we have uh, uh, 85 cows and calf and um, we're three quarters of it through calving now so we're getting back on track now and um, but really synchronization for me was a light bulb moment um so yeah, that's, that's, that's where we are now, yes. Brilliant. And just sticking with synchronization for a minute, so like there's, was there much work involved in that for you and what was the cost like? Yeah, um, not really. I mean, it's it's the, the, the workload, I mean, the, the labour aspect of it is, is is actually a big advantage. You know, I mean, rather than observing your cows three times daily for AI, you're getting them in three times in total for for a veterinary treatment and AI. So um, uh, we've we've a big workload on our farm, you know, and um, uh, I just don't have time to observe the cows three times a day, you know. So um, uh, from that point of view, from a labour point of view, the synchronisation really worked well on our farm, and um, it has allowed us to take back control of of the breeding aspect of our farm. Uh, we've been able to bring the breeding season forward. Uh, and and um, and shorten it at the far end. So we've we actually have a more compact breeding season now, and we hope to do the same next year. Uh, you know, and 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 uh, the, the the calving season starts with a, a good burst. You know, and 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 you're busy. You know, uh, more or less straight away, and you've a batch of calves there early, and they're they're gone to grass early. So it's uh, yeah, you hit the ground running. You know, so it's really good. Um, and it, we are focusing on breeding replacements on the farm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and this is where it's a real winner because you're using, you know, top AI genetics and, and those heifer calves, we have a batch of them born now on the farm and uh, the, 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 they were born early February. And, and those calves, like they have an extra two months to reach breeding weight um, uh, by next April, you know, so that's a big advantage, you know. So um, uh, I can't justify the price that... Um, nice quality, good quality breeding heifers are making uh, in, in the market. I just can't afford to pay it. They're making, you know, hobby farmer prices and uh, I can't compete there. So I really have to breed my own and I want to get back into breeding on my own like I was doing previously. So that's where we are at the moment now. So I'm, I'm, I'm on the road back to where I should be and synchronization has been a major part of that. Fantastic. And what cost are you looking at to synchronize with, say, one cow or one heifer, John? Well, the total cost is coming in, depending on the, the the cost of the AI straw, which varies between 30 and 40 euros, depending on, on what bull you're using. Uh, total cost is coming in around 75 euros. You know, but that's, the, but the important, that's per head, yeah. Yep. But the, 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 the important thing is the conception rate. I mean, if you're only getting 50% conception rate, that's 150 euro per calf on the ground, you know. So a good conception rate is important. You know, you want to be up around 70 or 80%. Um, as I said, we we're not there this year. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, but I intend getting there, and um, um, like I, I think it's a really good system, and it's it's um, it's it's one for me for the next for the foreseeable future, anyway. Brilliant, brilliant. And if we go back to you were saying with your situation with the bull, and then the heifers weren't in calf when you bought them home, like what actually happened there? What went wrong? 
we just I look at. I'm not sure there was obviously some health issue with the bull. It, it, okay. I mean, the, when I bought the bull, he was fertility tested. So mm -hmm. um, uh, and he was very uh, active. You know, I mean, uh, hands up. The manager here wasn't doing a brilliant job in that the 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 heifers were on an out farm which is uh, eleven miles away. They were seen maybe twice a week, and um, I was not recording what was in calf, what wasn't in calf. We've learned great lessons from that, you know. But um, um, we're doing a lot more um, uh, scanning now, and um, uh, that's given us a better idea of where we are, and we are going to be recording more into the future. But um, uh, so yeah, look, look, expensive lessons learned. Uh, we're selling cattle now shortly, and our sales are going to be down because of the damage that was done two years ago and three years ago. But um, uh, we have to take that on the chin and um, certainly learn those lessons. You know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And we'll say so. You're obviously using synchronization now to overcome that. But it, it, we could see from your video, you're still using two stock bulls in the farm. Like, would you still have? Would you have the same fear with them that they could go? infertile or are you doing anything to prevent that from happening in the future well look as as was said earlier uh, uh with david and with angus's farm you know um uh, we just have to um uh first of all just manage the bulls that bit differently okay. uh last year we gave the bulls a full health check you know and, and we found out that our our terminal charlotte bull was subfertile he actually okay. did more damage you know, he was the main problem back over the years. He did more damage than the guy that was infertile. The guy that was infertile, we knew there and then that year, mm -hmm. damage was the other guy was doing damage over a number of years. And and um, uh, so the subfertile bull w w was a serious problem. So look, I mean, a, a full health check, uh, get out your vet, do the fertility test, and uh, it costs about 100 euros a head and uh, well worth it. Um, look at it's not the silver bullet. It doesn't solve all your problems. You still have to manage. You still have to observe and manage and take action on time, you know, and 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 record what's happening. You know, you can't, you can no longer uh, leave it to what's going on over the years and, and, and sure we'll take a chance, we'll take a risk. The, 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 the penalties are so severe uh, if things go wrong. I mean, it just, I mean, regardless of how busy you are on the farm, your breeding herd is, is your number one, you know, and you just have to give those the attention. Definitely, definitely. Sounds like tough lessons learned, unfortunately, mm -hmm. John, but great that you can come on and share this with, with everybody who's listening. And David, if we move across to you, like, do you know, with, with, uh, I suppose a stroke of a lot of bad luck there with the infertile bull and the subfertile bull, what actually can affect a bull's fertility? Yeah, like, obviously we'll say anything that can affect his general health, Ashling would say, potentially can. But if you take, as I mentioned earlier, we'll say uh, locomotion, we'll say limb health, for example, is absolutely critical. So again, he has to be in, he has to be able to, we'll say, track cows. He has to be able to mate, physically mate the cows. Um, John mentioned there about heat. Certainly, we'd say we know that you know the sperm, uh, qual uh, the survival essentially would say the sperm would say, and the manufacturer we call it, for want of a better word, of the sperm, uh, within the testes, you know, is very sensitive to heat. You know, and we've seen that with both bulls and rams there over the last couple of years where we've had periods we'll say of excessively high you know up to 30 degrees would we'll say celsius so again it's 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 to be i suppose be conscious of those kind of things anything that could affect we'll say inflammation for example or a rise in body temperature equally you know so a chill cold you know any issues we'll say like that potentially could have a latent effect and the problem is that if you take we'll say if a bull has some kind of a health and or other issue, we'll say there, it takes about 60 days or so for a new batch of, of, of sperm, we'll say, to actually reach the stage with which, which they're capable of fertilizing an egg, we'll say, or in other words, you know, um, you know, put the cow um, in care for, essentially. So we need to be conscious of that. So if, if a bull is, is, is subfertile or infertile, it might be because of something that happened, you know, up to two months ago. So it's just to be very, and John, you know, very, very clearly outlined some of the issues there that he's experienced himself. And I'd, you know, fully back that. And 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 absolutely, John, like one of the key things that John mentioned there is the subfertile bull. That's the guy that's going to cause a lot more damage, we'll say, than the infertile bull because of the, you know, the more the more difficult it is to actually identify those issues. In the infertile guy, you're going to see a lot of cows repeating very quickly. You know, there'll be lots of activity. Whereas the subfertile will be getting some cows and calf and some others, and they they're the ones that can lead to very poor scanning results, maybe in September, October, we'll say, you know, at the end of the year. So, as I say, 
you know, it's really will say anything that could potentially affect like 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 a cow, for example, anything that, you know, that could potentially affect their, their health, their locomotion, you know, or indeed would say their their um you know, their general as I say, general health status. Very good. And are there any figures, David, on the percentage of bulls that are infertile? And um, firstly, yeah, it's, it's something that's fertile. difficult to get a, a handle on, you know, because okay. again, it's not something that we're routinely recording. Mm -hmm. But having said all that, you know, the, it's thought that anything up to maybe one in 20, about 5% could be fully infertile. Um, whereas about one in, one in every five bulls, one in every four bulls, maybe up to 25% could be subfertile. You know, and again, as I say, you know, that might be just for a period of the breeding season, but they could cause a lot of damage depending on the, the timing, you know, on the, the I suppose, the, the amount of cows that are coming in heat would say that will coincide with that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So okay. vigilance, as John said there, vigilance, you know, absolutely critical. And and it's not alone just for the use of AI, but also equally if you're dependent on a stock bull, vigilance is, is critical. Definitely, definitely. It's kind of the, the biggest theme, I suppose, that's coming through from, from me so far tonight. Um, I'm going to invite Angus uh, back on to, to turn on his camera and I just see there's plenty of questions coming in already in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. So if any um, of the audience members want to submit anything, um, feel free and we'll come to them in a few minutes. Um, so Angus, uh, moving back to you for a minute, like just because you've a, a heat detection system there, um, you're relying on that, but you're also relying on your own record keeping as well. When we say record keeping, like, are you writing down? The, the I, I, or? I would, and I'd uh, just keep it in the hard watch there, just an app there. Um, mm. you know, I use the the heat the heat sensor as well. Like, they they have an app as well, and they have the cycling as well. So between the two of them, I uh, for the first while I just keep it in hard watch, and then they keep the twenty one days, or I think it comes in there after nineteen days. They give you say that cow should be coming into heat again. Um, or that heifer should be coming into heat as well, but that's all. I really, yeah, uh, that's like I keep on an eye on them two things. Really, yeah, that's all. Fantastic, that's brilliant. And just sticking with the technology for the minute as well, John, with the the way you're synchronizing the cows, like, how ha have you considered using sex semen, <coughs> Mister Wasn't any of them, or are you sticking with the conventional semen going forward? Um. I think for the moment we'll stick with conventional because the conception rates can be a bit higher. Mm -hmm. As I said, the results this year weren't as good as I would like. So I'd really like to be on top of that first before I start to experiment with sex semen. But yes, look, it would be a big advantage if I was using it and it was successful. You know, as I said, you need those breeding, uh, those calves that are potentially going to be bred on the farm. You need them born early in the season and you need them born to AI. So if you had more of them, of course, it would be a good success. But look at getting the cows and calves is the number one, you know, and um, uh, we're going to focus on that uh, for, for the moment. But yes, sex semen would be an option for me in the future. Very good. And have you considered it in your farming, Seth? I have. I've used it uh, last year. Um, <laughs> no, I... I suppose it, I used it on TV really on two cows and one that went in calf to, uh, to it. Um, now, my problem was last year that I what was happening was that um, at night, uh, the activity, they were mounting the cow. Like I also, along with the moose heat sensor, I use um, tail painting or heat patches on them. And what I was finding was that... Um, it was happening at night, so obviously I usually check them around nine, ten o'clock anyway, and then in the morning before I go to school, I check them as well. But I was happy, I didn't have a clue what time or you know they were mounting, and um, so hopefully this year that I I um that I'd see them coming into to, uh you know, be mounted, so I'd know exactly the the time when they'd be mounted. So obviously it's later, it's about eighteen hours later that you don't be doing it. Um, but I I didn't I didn't know, so I had the straws bought and then the canister and everything. And to be used this year, hopefully, and um, yeah, I think it's a great job because obviously replacements on my place, like along with John, it's it's kind of where I I need to get them better. I've bought um heifers in the in the past and they just didn't work out for for me, so I really need the the real good quality re replacements. And um, you know, I do see that it is a, a great job, but it just takes that little bit extra. Uh, to, I suppose to find out when they're actually be mounted. I suppose if I knew exactly, I I could use it. Um, yeah. really, yeah. 
I think both of you, John, and you picked up an important point there in terms of the um the conception rates and the timing. But David, could you go into a little bit more detail on that? Like, why why is the timing so important? And um, what are the expected conception rates from using sex straws versus conventional AI straws? Yeah, sure. I suppose Ashling would say the sexing process. So essentially, the semen is being passed through a laser, mm -hmm. and it's diverting, we'll say, the male bearing uh, sperm and the female uh, bearing sperm in two different uh, uh, directions, depending on which, you know, obviously we'll say which one you're, you're after. And that's based on very, very, something like about 3% difference in the DNA content between a, an X or a, um, or a Y, is, it would say a female or a, or a male would say um, bearing sperm. Um, so that in itself can, that process would say can slightly damage the, the sperm. So, you know, th th let's say that the sperm are a bit more fragile that have been sexed compared to, the, the you know, the, the conventional semen. So from that perspective, then, you know, ideally what you want is that that, the, 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 that semen is placed in the cow's or heifer's womb at a slightly later time relative to the onset of heat or closer, I suppose, to the, uh, to the release of the egg or ovulation, you know. So it's not hanging around as long because it doesn't have the same lifespan. So that's the reason why you have a, I suppose, a delay, essentially, we'll say, in the timing of insemination for the sixth semen versus the conventional. Very good. And in terms of like what John is doing with the synchronization, would that help a bit more with the timing or are, they be are cows better off or heifers better off working off of a natural heat? Yeah, and like in fairness, like synchronization works very, very particularly with heifers, would say, but both cows and heifers works very, very well. And it's again, I suppose, like what we talked about earlier, would say attention to detail. Um, the synchronization obviously will say you have more control if you want to do what we call timed AI. So in other words, you want to time it relative, would say, to when the progesterone device, whether it be a predator or a seeder, is, is is removed. So you have a bit more control, you know. And if you're relying particularly, we'll say, on a commercial service, we'll say, a technician to come out. You know, you have more control and you you can obviously get more animals inseminated at the one time if they're synchronized. So, you know, it's really down to, you know, and, and there are standard, I suppose, protocols there for, I suppose, the time of um, insemination for either sexed or conventional semen relative to when, you know, you removed the progesterone containing device. In other words, as I say, the predator disease from the animal. Very good, very good. And just in terms of them conception rates then for a conventional versus um, sex straw, what are you looking yeah, at? Yeah, generally, like in the region of about 80%, we'll say you'd expect. So 80 to 90% maybe in, hef in heifers, but it would say in general about maybe 10 to 20 percentage points lower on average, we'll say for the, the cows in, or heifers inseminated with sex versus um, versus conventional semen. So you, you, you won't... On average, you won't get the the, the, the same, um, but it's it certainly it's improved dramatically compared to when I suppose uh, in the last in the last number of years compared to you know a number of years ago. So there's been a lot of work done in terms of optimizing both the the semen uh, sexing process, but also and the number of sperm that's included in a straw will say relative to you know what might be the case five six years ago. And if, in fairness, particularly on the dairy side. Some of our colleagues in Moorpark, Stephen Butler and others, have done an awful lot of work in trying to uh, optimize that problem. Definitely. And it's great to see so many beef bulls coming available on the market as well. Like yeah, giving a lot more options to beef farmers. And John, if we move back to you, so like the majority of people in uh, beef farmers in the country are using stock bulls. And we talked a lot about that stock bull management. So when you were buying in them new bulls on the farm, how did you manage them? Well, um, normally uh, we would manage a bull by, you know, introducing him slowly to the herd, uh, uh, having him practically in quarantine for a while and making sure he was OK um, and let him acclimatise to, to the farm. That was normally the way, whereas now i will be taking a different approach. You know, I mean, it'll be a full health check, you know, and um, um, fertility test and um, as they would say in their locomotion, all the other aspects of, of, of the health, you know, and um, um but yeah, look at I mean the, the bulls are in the, in the in the in the house now. They'll be out to grass there uh, as soon as possible whenever the weather acclimatizes, and they'll be out for a while before they're uh, introduced to the cows. Uh, but the cows will be aired first, so maybe a fortnight after uh, uh, synchronizing and aiding, the the bulls will be introduced to the to the cows. That's what we did last year, and that's at the moment that's the plan. Um, this year coming. Now there there is possibly an opportunity to AI the cows a second time, you know, if yeah. if we can observe the heat. Um, 
my fear there is the bull has a better chance of getting them in calf than <laughs> than um than my observation techniques and uh, uh th there's a higher risk involved that we won't have as many in calf so there lies the debate we'll see how it works out closer to the time and uh, if we can go in with uh, in a ai straw uh, for a repeat performance well and good but um we we'll have to make sure that the stock pools are 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 um uh, in at peak performance and ready to ready to go. Very good. So they're settled. And we'll say for buying in a new bull, like how many cows would you run with a young bull versus maybe a more mature bull? Well, a young bull, I mean, like twenty twenty five would be the max, you know. Whereas um, with the um, more mature bull, like generally he'd run with forty. But I mean. The fact that we have synchronized the one bull, mm -hmm. we're going to get away, which is one bull uh, uh, with the main herd, one terminal bull, and so he will be running with possibly uh, up to up to seventy, seventy five cows, you know. But we hope that you know the majority of those will be in calf uh, uh, anyway, you know. So mm -hmm. um, uh, and of course, like we're we're saved the expense of having a third bull on the farm, uh, a replacement bull on the farm, and. Um, um, so, yeah, that, they're the kind of figures we'll be talking about. You know, a, a two bull system at the moment suits us fine now with, with synchronization. If not, we'd have to have three bulls. Very good. And did you ever think of buying that replacement bull? Yes, well, over the years, we have had three bulls on the farm. We, okay. We've had had a, a, a high replacement index bull on the farm. And um, um, I will be going back. <laughs> to that eventually once I'm breeding enough replacements of my own I will but like the replacement bull on the farm is a very expensive animal because mm -hmm. number one he's you, you have to change that bull uh, more regularly than the terminal bull because his daughters are coming along and it's the biggest you know uh, investment you know every four years that you must make you know and it's a crucial decision and and uh, you, really want, you need to be going for top genetics there and it's to, to get that is expensive so uh, at the moment, synchronization, you know, there's a big saving there in not having to have that bull on the farm. Um, um, so, yes, probably when we're up and running back to where we should be, it will be an option, but not at the moment um, uh, until we are breeding enough replacements um, uh, and we're fully independent on the farm. Very good. That's fair enough. And Inga, from your side of things, like you're only using AI for the last four years, but yet you now for um for last year, you had 84% of the cows calving down on the farm to AI. Does it justify having that bull there for you now or what's your plan with him going forward? Um, It probably doesn't justify it. I know it doesn't justify it. He's there now for the last probably eight years. So he's kind of has himself paid off. Yeah. Um. Now in the future, I'll have to have this discussion <laughs> Um, but if I can replace, uh, you know, have enough replacements coming, if I could keep my eye to maybe six, seven weeks, eight weeks, you know, and call it after that, like sometimes after six, seven weeks, you kind of, you know, I won't say you get kind of browned off of it and it's grand just to let off the stock bull. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, after two or three years, I think I will have to call, call um, call myself aside and see what I'm going to do with the bull because uh, if I had to go invest in say you know 5,000 euro in a bull to bull maybe three cows um, maybe less maybe maybe four cows whatever like um, like it's going to be 5,000 euro and like what's to to, to run like just, it just won't pay like so I I'd probably if, if my AI goes well and I get my replacements I'd be hoping and that I won't, John, you know, just keep a few extra replacements mm -hmm. and um, cut out the stock bowl altogether. But as of now, um, I want to get as many in calf. I went down to, with TB this year, and um, so I have still have to get them back in calf as well. And um, so I'm down probably, I've seven last to, to I've only heard like around 30 cows, and I've seven last to uh, TB. So it, I still have to get them all back in calf. Um, for the next year or two, I'll be still using the stock bull. Um, but after that, I'll have to pull myself aside and see five thousand euro to bull two, two or three cows, four cows. It won't make sense, like so. Um, like my replacements this year, like I have eleven replacements this year coming through, and I'll be hoping with you know dim replacements in two or three years' time, and they'll have hopefully super replacements as well. So I hopefully will have enough replacements every year. You know, to cover me myself and I won't need a stock bull. So yeah. hopefully it, it will work out for me. Yeah, definitely. And like you're reducing the risk there of anything going wrong by having the you know the the moo heat there by keeping your records, having the sectomized bull. So yeah. yeah and like you can let, 
like you can let off the for a second mile bull, you know, for as long as you need, like, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, and if one kind of but I'll be afraid down a few years like this, you know, like say for now I'll probably have to still run up the nine weeks, ten weeks, you know, breeding like just to to cover uh the amount of cows that I'm doing, like so that I have I have my thirty cows come back in quickly enough next year, the year after, like yeah. you know, hopefully I get up to thirty thirty two or three like on right. at home. Brilliant, that'll be great. Okay, I see there's a good few questions coming in on the chat box, so I we'd move on to them in one sec. So just before we do, I John and Ingsa, I'm going to ask you to give what's your most uh, the most important thing that you do on your farm for the breeding season, or what advice you'd have for other farmers. And David, I'll ask you the same question as well in a sec, and um, particularly with the wet weather that we're having this this year, have you any advice for farmers? So John, I'll start with you. What's your top tip? Well, I mean, as um, David said about having the cows in the right condition, that's most mm-hmm. important. Um, uh, out on grass is, is is a big help now. Most of our cows are calving out; over half of them are out, and 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 that's important to keep good grass in front of them. You know, you want to maintain body condition or have it increasing. Yeah. That's that's important. And clearly, from my mistakes, you know, the NCT and the bulls, um, uh, most important. Um, for 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 a hundred years ahead, like it's it's money well very well invested. So that's that's the quickest tip that I can uh, come up with. Brilliant, thanks very much, John. And yourself, Ingus, you're not allowed to repeat now what John said. <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose like you, it's not coming back. Tea detection is probably my biggest straight away. Mm-hmm. I'd be you know watching cows see you know if there's hair missing or whatever. Like you know if there's any action going on them, checking them, uh, getting them. Getting them cycling, I suppose. I'm sorry, kind of cutting back over John, like, uh, echoing, like, you know, I suppose it all goes back to having them out in grass, having the body condition score, but cycling, getting them cycling and, and watching what's going on and taking note of what's going on, I suppose, is the biggest thing because if you don't, you could have 25 of them there, everything cycling and five are giving trouble or whatever. You have to, you, you have to record what's going on and see what's actually happening if you don't record i suppose i suppose i should being down to recording i suppose would be my biggest thing really see what's That's going okay. on yeah we'll give you that one it didn't overlap with john then <laughs> <laughs> and david from your side of things i suppose particularly with the wet weather now and maybe heifers replacement heifers in particular might be behind target from last year with the wet year and now they're you know obviously they haven't been able to to get to grass for a good grazing season so far this spring have you any tips for any farmers that are a little bit worried about them yeah what am I? Uh, you know i think you make a good point there actually would say you know we know from our own research there that i suppose the weight of the heifer at about maybe eight nine months of age is probably the the single biggest effect you know other than the breed like we know for example we'll say the early maturing as the name might suggest, breeds will say will be on, you know, they'll go through puberty and they'll start their normal reproductive cycles at an earlier age than the continental heifers. Yeah. But outside of that, you know, we know that that kind of, I suppose the housing weight would say really would say probably has the biggest influence on when that heifer is going to start cycling, you know, when she's going to undergo puberty. After that, then the rate of feeding will say or the performance of the, of the heifer over the winter will have some influence, but, but probably a, a lot less than their earlier performance. So it's really the first eight months life is, it has a, has a, a good weaning weight, in other words, we'll say, and a good, I suppose, weight gain between weaning and housing is, is, is really important. As you say there, they can compensate to some degree, then we'll say, if they can be turned out earlier, we'll say, get that, you know, kilogram a day plus, we'll say, right up to the start of breeding. Because what you want at the end of the day is that the vast majority of your heifers have started cycling at the start of the breeding season, that they'll go and calf, in the first three weeks, ideally, with certainly the first six weeks of the breeding season, because they will typically take that bit longer as cows, first calvers, we'll say the following year. So if you don't want them to slip out of the herd, we'll say there, the earlier that they get pregnant and calf down in their first calving season, we'll say the better chance they have of surviving in the herd. So outside of that, then, as I mentioned earlier, Ashling, try to avoid where possible at all fluctuations in grass, grass supply. So in other words, for cattle, are, you know, you're going, you're motion away nicely, we'll say, and all of a sudden because of poor, you know, weather, whether it be, you know, excessive rain, whether it be like we we we'll get from time to time, we'll say, you know, drought conditions, you know, that you run out of grass or just poor, poor grassland management. So that, you know, in itself can have very dramatic effects, we'll say, on the conception rate during that particular period of time. Okay, so hopefully if the weather settles down, there'll be plenty of grass out there and they can stay out and stay settled. But 
for um for now anyway even if they're still in sheds and and have been out maybe and come back in once there's no major fluctuations from from a dietary side of it that's kind of the biggest okay very good um okay so i think martina has been keeping an eye on the questions and, and answers there so um we can start off going through a few of them Perfect. Thanks, Ashton. Yeah, good few questions in here. So uh, rapid fire, rapid fire answers. Um, Ing said the vasectomized bull, there's a couple of questions around him. Um, yeah. How much did it cost? Who did it? When did you do it? And are you worried about having a, a vasectomized bull in your farm? Um, How much did it cost? Um, with a call out, it's 60 euros. That's what he charged me last year anyway. Now, it could have been with an extra call out. I can't remember, but I just looked through the bill the other day and it was 60 euro. Um, the next thing was, do I worry about having a sectomized bull? It was like anything with a bull, I suppose. There's always dangers. But now he is very light. I get rid of him very early. Um, he like He's probably 400 kilos when he's kind of, you know, doing breeding. He's, you know, he's active. He's not really... Uh, he's very small. He's gone after the second year. He's not getting, you know, aggressive or anything like that. Um, and when do you do him? How long before let? I, him... well, I do, I do it extra early now. I do it uh, before he goes into the shed. Say, I buy him say around February, March. I try buy him fairly early. Um, then I, um, I do him around September time. Okay. You know, before when the grass say is there and it's nice and clean outside. And then he's well able to join. If anything happens in October, I can put him back in the shed. He's well, you know, cleaned up and everything like that. And then uh, I do it that 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 early now, to be honest with you, yeah. Perfect. And one more question for you, Wing. Is that the the AI, your AI in the cows, you're working full time. Yeah. How are you managing it? Um. Well, I well the Moo heat sensor straight away. The like some the the Moo heat sensor will tell you like say if there's something happening. So straight away, I'd uh, ring the AI man. Uh, like, I keep an eye on then when it's mounted. And then I do the morning and evening. Like, if I see him mounting in the morning, I do him the evening. If he's doing the e or in the evening, I do him the morning. And then again, like, I if it's happening, say, 5 o'clock in the evening, I discuss it with the, if it's a heifer or a cow or whatever, I discuss it with the AI technician. And sometimes he's passing up and down the road and he'd say, put her in whatever time. And I uh, will leave it like that. But I put it in the morning. In the evening, really, that's my two kind of things generally. Like, yeah, your AM, so, PM, yeah. like you have yeah. road systems then set up to get the cows in. Yeah, like we'd uh, right. we'd have paddocks around the the house, um, uh, on that as well as that. I usually keep recording what's happening for the first uh, three weeks. So obviously, the first first week, I know what's going to be kind of roughly coming into heat. The second week and the third week, I know what's coming coming into heat. So then after that, I just keep them very close to the the house. Um, then it's just you know the paddock system, and I have a little roadways, small little roadways, and cow pets made, and just straight into the into the shade then, like with them. So you're set up for John. Yeah. Um, on on your system, you have a lot going on there. Like, would you ever think of getting in a system like, say, the Moo Heat or the Sense Hub or any of those monitoring <clears throat> systems? Yeah, well, we've looked at those systems, and we've looked at um having a vasectomized bull on the farm, and um. But we found that the synchronization was just from a labor point of view was um, um, much more beneficial to me. Um, uh, our herd is a larger herd and um, uh, I just don't seem to have the time to uh, to dedicate to uh, watching them on, on, on a daily basis. And um, uh, so like it's synchronization seems to be the, 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 the best option for us at the moment. And another question came in there on the on the bull, the 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 Angus bull that you bought. Had you time to acclimatize him, or was he overfed, or like do you know? No, there was no time to acclimatize him. Um, uh, the um, the bull that that um he replaced uh, 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 was injured and given trouble, and we had to buy a bull in a hurry. So he got no uh, 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 acclimatization. At at time to acclimatize at all so uh, that may have been a feature but um he should have put some heifers in calf uh, uh interestingly enough 
uh, we put him in the shed to fatten him for the winter and and he was the last animal to leave and 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 he wasn't fat so there was some issue there apart from uh, uh, infertility you know because i mean he came with a clean bill of health he came with a a, a, a fertility test and um uh, and the farmer that i bought him off if we came to an amicable agreement there uh, with him so um uh, but there was other health issues with him but i mean it's it's it highlights the importance of, of observing you know i was depending totally on on scanning and um, um, so that's too late, you know. So yeah. And on pre-breeding scans, like Angus, are you doing a pre-breeding scan? Yeah, my do is uh, about three to four weeks b- beforehand. Um, just uh, some some there's always one or two cows to be something wrong with them to be dirty or maybe cyst or whatever, or even. I could see heifers that are, haven't even come cycling yet, or even cows haven't come cycling, and you know, just extra observation on them. Or if I have to pull one aside and extra feeding or anything like that, you know, you know, it could be obviously the weight and all that. But um, it just it's a great job for me anyway. It's very cheap. Um, like I think three euro a cow or two euro a cow or something like that. It is uh, roughly. Um, like you know, it wouldn't cost much more than with call out and everything. Hundred euro. It definitely wouldn't call out, you know, wouldn't cost me anything like like that. And then for the ones extra like that, maybe the whole sit breeding wouldn't cost me 150 euro kind of thing. Like so, it's I think it's great for me anyway. Works for you. And John, yeah. uh, you doing any pre breeding? Uh, no, not so far. Uh, something we will consider. But uh, um, at the moment, in conjunction with synchronization, we have been scanning at, you know, between 35 and 40 days uh, after AIing. So that has showed up some problem with some cows that weren't in calf. And um, so, yeah, it's something we should consider to do in the future. Um, uh, but so far, we haven't been doing it. Um, uh, uh, as I say, like we do. Part of synchronization is you need to scan um, after 35 days to see what's in calf to AI and what's going to be in calf to the um, your stock pulls. Okay. And a couple there then for for David. Um, with the bulls, do bulls get less fertile with age? Yeah, I suppose, again, it's difficult to get good statistics outside of, I suppose, AI bulls really would say... Um, Martina, where, you know, there would be, I suppose, the semen would be, you know, looked at in, in great detail. And if you look at a bull typically peaks probably between three and four years of age in terms of the volume of semen, would say, and the number of sperm that it produces. And then you can see a kind of almost linear decline after that. So obviously that both of those two things combined, you know, have an influence in the amount of cows that he can or heifers he can cover, would say, in a, in a season. Okay. You know, so they probably peak for fertility probably after about four years of age. Okay. And say looking at doing synchronization programs, John is doing one there, Cedars and Prids. You've done a good lot of work on synchronization programs in, in Chagas. Um can you just give us a quick run through and we'll have these the, the presentation is recorded and we'll have the actual um one that uh, that David is going to talk to here to put up afterwards. But just give us a quick run through the synchronization program and maybe where you could fall down on that program. Yeah, so a few years ago, Martina, we ran a big trial, you know, about 70 or 80 herds over two years across the entire island of Ireland, uh, 2,200 cows in total synchronised. So we looked at three different variations of a programme, all based on a seven-day uh, progesterone releasing device, um, GNRH, or, you know, the likes of Receptor, for example, would say would be, a, a, I suppose, a commercial variant of it uh, at the start. Um, prostaglandin would say, or the likes of estrimate, for example, would say at removal seven days later, and then fixed time AI or time AI as we call it, 72 hours or three days after we remove the print. So that's kind of the basis, I suppose, of the of the um of the overall program. Uh, and we looked at small small tweaks in that. But looking at it overall, I suppose the three there were some small differences between the programs, but generally would say we got something between 55 and 60 percent conception rate, would say, to that, to a, to a time day where the farmer organized, would say, the, the uh, actual insemination. And, you know, there was a multitude of bulls, a multitude of AI technicians used, would say, across all those herds. Um, the other thing was that on average, about 50 percent of those cows were not cycling at all at the start of the program. OK, they were all about at least. Uh, five weeks calved as well so that's that's an important thing when you're looking at doing any synchronization you want to make sure that the womb has fully healed or involuted come back to more or less its normal size again we'll say before you commence it equally we'll say when we looked at, uh, retrospectively at the at the conception rates we found that those cows are in better condition 
and they were slightly longer caved, generally would say had, had better results. Um, but when we combined, we'll say on those, most of those herds, they would have ran like 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 the lads there would they would they would have a stock bull, we'll say as well, and they the the generally in those herds the bulls were turned in about maybe a week to ten days after the cows were inseminated, and when you combined the actual conception rates, the I plus the repeat that was picked up generally by a bull, about eighty percent of the cows on those herds you know, were in calf in the first three weeks of the breeding season. So that, you know, that that bodes very, very well for tightening up, we'll say, the following calf and, I suppose, season, you know, there and, you know, essentially, we'll say, uh, ensuring the cows have a 365-day calf and interval. And that's very similar to what you did, John, isn't it? That's correct. Yes, uh, I I would agree with David's figures there. Um, um, it's it's look at it's it's I've been able to shorten my breeding season by by um uh, two weeks and and I've moved it forward w one week. So you you can you can you can manage it better, you know. And um, uh, I tend through the same this year. So so um, next year, please God, in uh, around the twentieth of January, I'll be starting to calve, and uh, most of the calving will be. The calf will be over uh, uh, at the beginning of April, so um, no more May calves. Um, uh, so that will give me a better Benefit. management style, you know. So uh, calves will be more suitable to the grazing season, um, uh, and they'll be heavier coming in the autumn. So um, definitely, uh, David's figures there are are what I would agree with. Um, uh, that's what we have found. Okay, Martin, I might just add one point there, just for clarity. You know, often when we're talking to farmers, there's a perception out there that if you start synchronizing or you do, you know, you know, manipulating the breeding, I suppose, cycle of the cow, that you're going to ha have negative effects on her. You know, so essentially all you're doing is you're you're interrupting the natural process for a short period. It has no, I suppose, subsequent effect on our next cycle or indeed our cycle later that year or the next year. So essentially all you're doing really will say if you bring as John very clearly outlined earlier, if you bring her forward and get her on calf earlier this year, even if you never synchronized her next year, you're straight away having a positive effect all in sequel in terms of bringing that cow forward compared to where she may or well have, you know, the time she might have calved had, had you not synchronized her. Okay. I so there's a question that came in on that synchronization, the programs and, and um David has just gone through what he's done there. Um I suppose with the, the whole using AI, are you better to, to AI on the first cycle or the second cycle? Yeah, like I suppose once the cow was back in normal cyclicity, there should be no no problem, you know, um in either. You should expect you know, there, there used to be a school of thought at one stage that, it, you know, up to about maybe three heats, we'll say, after the resumption that you were getting a slight increase. But I think, to be honest with you, Martina would say, once the cow is having normal uh, heat cycles, UAI as soon as, as she's presenting a proper heat like. Okay. And there's two quick questions. A lot of questions have just come in and they're, they're technical type questions. And, and somebody has just said that they, we haven't left enough time for them. If the cow is in standing heat in the morning, is it better to leave her to the following morning to inseminate her? So if she's in standing heat this today, this morning, when is the best time to inseminate her? I think you should fall within the, you know, the 12 hour rule, ideally. You know, so, you know, within about 12 hours of when you've seen her, you know, on heat, because again, she could be on heat for a long period before that. Yeah. So better uh, to err on the side of caution rather than delaying it too much. Okay. And then uh, for David, is there any research on scrotal size of a bull leading to more fertile daughters uh, looking at maybe more hormonally balanced cattle? Yeah, again, there was some work from the States there going back a number of years ago, Martina, that suggested that, that, that bulls genetically at least would say that had larger scrotums would say had earlier um you know had heifers that were you know that that that, that went through puberty earlier in other words the starters you know become you know were available i suppose for breeding earlier and maybe slightly more fertile it, it, it's not clear to be honest that that information okay and for angus there uh, there's a question you buy in a vasectomize or you buy in a, a frisian calf to vasectomize would you not keep one of your own and and run him um i've thought of that as well um no i just uh, i i like the system that i'm running uh, i know you're going to say buy security i know where i'm buying them from um i just um no, I, I just rather just find the, I have no major reasoning behind it. I've often, people ask me that and I have no major reasoning behind it. it just, it just works fine for me. And, and, 
it, 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 it uh, has no, I have no, no reason why it would change it, John. I come away. So, and I know where I'm buying it from. So there's no bias security really on that side of things. Like, I have quite often. Long. Lads will say they have a Frisian calf and he's buckled reared and he's quiet and you're able to come in and he's yeah he's easier handled yeah, than just, one of your own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He just um, he just has I I don't see any why I I wouldn't like you know that kind of a way. Um, it's working out fine for the last four or five years like and um, people have asked me like you know you're bringing in trouble for yourself and that but no it's it's off he's off quiet always and it's it's just fine for me like. Perfect. Listen, we've run over a little bit over time. There was a huge amount of questions, as there always is in, in this side of things. There was a question came in about the different systems, and uh, Angus is using the, the Muheat system. We have Trevor Boland is on tomorrow night, and he's using the Sense Hub, so we can ask him about that tomorrow night. So I just what leaves me to, to, to do the thank yous for tonight. And um, I just want to thank everybody for coming on. I want to thank John and Angus especially. It's it's hard to come on and, and leave your whole system bare. Um, and they had very honest conversation here about what has happened on their farms and what they have done. I want to thank David for coming on and sharing his um, expertise um, for tonight. I'd also like to thank the local advisors, like the lads are inside in offices there in, in, in Tullamore and in, in Athenry to make sure everything ran okay so Bernard Dooley and Michal Kelly really want to thank them for, for all of their help they had in putting together tonight we hope you found it useful um, we'll have an, our last of our webinars is going to be next Wednesday evening or Wednesday coming at 8 o'clock and we'll have Wesley Brown and, and Trevor Boland will be on the call Wesley is a full time farmer 90 suckler cows calving in the spring time of the year finishes bulls as under 16 months and selling his heifers as replacements and then we have Trevor. He's a part-time farmer in Sligo. He's calving 50 cows in the autumn of the year and he sells all his his animals, uh, his male animals at 11 months and his females at a year, year and a half. Really, really different systems that they are running on their farms and what we're going to talk through with the lads is what are they going to do going forward as regards their breeding policy and where will they see their herd in five, ten years time and how are they going to manage that? The recording from tonight is going to be up on the Chagas Future Beef webpage, so you'll be able to see that there and the, the presentations, which also include the two synchronisation programmes. We'll do our best to try and get the, the answers um, that we didn't get around to tonight and we'll put them up there as well. So just and to thank yourselves for, for coming on, for your engagement. There's a huge amount of questions that have come in. I hope you found it useful and we hope you see you on next Wednesday night. And all that for us to say is good night. And we don't have to say safe home. Hopefully uh, most of you are at home. So thanks, everybody. And hopefully we'll see you Wednesday. Thank you. Bye bye.